Welcome to The Best Living Show. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet. Breathe, eat, sleep, thrive in every aspect of your life. What does thriving actually mean? Thriving is not a word, it's an action, a way of living. And that's what The Best Living Show is all about. So get ready, step into a new narrative and find a new way of being. There's a beautiful connection, a spark that flies at the intersection between the genetic code and your internal guidance system. We're going to throw away the culture that will tell us that thriving is something only for a few. Every one of us is unique. It's our time to discover why. The Best Living Show starts now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I am so excited about tonight's show. I have Victor with me, who is a coach. He is a lifelong martial artist, uh, philosophy enthusiast, uh, goofball, <laughs> among countless other things. And he is the founder of Zen Stoic Philosophy. And um, I got the opportunity to see Victor speak earlier this year, and it was captivating. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I've got to have him on the show. Um, his philosophy is a hybrid of um, timeless wisdom brought into the modern age to help people create an unshakable inner peace, which is something I think all of us are striving for. He believes that the path to true lasting fulfillment is uh, uh, to live by serving from an overflowing cup, which is a very interesting concept. I, I got to hear Victor talk about this uh, at the last um, conference I went to, which we'll touch on tonight for sure. Uh, his vision is to liberate 1 million people from their own emotional debt and into a life of emotional prosperity by the year 2030. So that's a big ambitious goal there. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people listening, and I think you might be able to reach some of those uh, tonight and really wants to help you operate from the highest levels of contribution for fulfillment on a daily basis. Um, he does this by facilitating leadership training. He's uh, designed um, uh, impact focused leadership, you know, into greatness, uh, proliferating transformational work in his communities. He does, uh, you know, different modalities of training. He's a certified trainer, master practitioner in neurolinguistic programming. Um, he's a practitioner of timeline therapy. He uh, is also a certified coach. He is a hypnosis master. I mean, what is there that that, that Victor hasn't done? <laughs> he's uh, very qualified. So, uh, welcome to the show, Victor. I am so excited because. When I saw you speak earlier this year, it, like I said, it was captivating. And this idea of uh, serving from that full cup, tell mm -hmm. me what that is and the listeners, what that is about. What, what's the idea behind that? Yeah. So serving from an overflowing cup is essentially a philosophy, a way of being that I espouse to each and every day. And essentially what I've realized in coaching people over the last decade is that each individual person is the source of all of the good that they bring into other people's lives. And so what's really important is that it's, we do want to serve others. We do want to be able to be that vessel of hope and of resource for other people as well in our lives. We do want to be others focused a lot of the time. And at the same time to realize that we are that vessel of all the good that we do in their lives. So with that being said, we need to take care of ourselves so that we have more to give. And if we attempt to serve from an empty cup or from a cup that has holes in it, that's out of integrity, so to speak, it makes it a lot more difficult for us to bring our best foot forward. And I also noticed that when we do try to serve from an empty cup, oftentimes it can lead to us feeling resentful or bitter if we're not essentially filling ourselves up in return. So fill it, serving from an overflowing cup is essentially coming from a full place, emotionally speaking, where you're doing what you need to do for yourself on a regular basis so that you have reserves, so that you have the capacity to actually serve people at the highest level and not coming from this place of empty. It's not to say that you can't work that muscle when you need it, right? <laughs> because we're not always going to feel perfect and full right. all the time, but it's more of an, uh, an aspiration 
is to come from this full cup is it's like putting the oxygen mask on yourself first right. so that you can continue doing that. You can continue being the vessel of the good that you do. Yeah. And I think that that analogy, I mean, I've, I use that myself, the, the whole oxygen mask first, like, Hey, you've been on a plane, right? You got to put your mask on first before you can help anybody else. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, uh, clients, when they come in, they are, really trying to please a lot of other people and spreading themselves thin in, in working to fill everybody else's cup before they're actually looking at themselves. So um, what kind of what kind of things do you uh, find people do to, to really work on, on that? Um, in terms of like filling their own cup? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say it's different for everybody. Um, for some people, it depends on, I think, a lot of the time, the season of life that you're in, right? We all have different stages of life where right. we have different needs. We have a different purpose um, for that particular moment in our life. Perhaps, you know, like as a teenager, for example, we have a different life purpose <laughs> and a different, a different sense of ourselves and what fills us up than we do in our early 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. So these things, they all change with the seasons of life. And I think what's important is to be able to be real with oneself in terms of what is it that actually allows you to feel alive? What is it that actually allows you to feel your sense of being centered? Because it really and truly doesn't take too much, right? I'm not necessarily a believer in super long morning routines or like, you know, <laughs> giving yourself a spa day every day to just so that you can get into the day. So that's not right. what this concept means, but it's more so like, what is it that allows you to find your center? What is it that allows you to be in a place where you feel filled up emotionally. So for some people that could be something like meditation for others, it could be prayer um, for some people it could be reading in the morning. It could be working out, whatever that is, that's going to bring somebody into that place of energy and not the same thing is going to work for all the same people. Right. So for example, like one person might feel really invigorated by working out in the morning, whereas another person actually might not right? They might feel more invigorated if they go and write in the morning or if they journal. So it really depends on the person and there's no one size fits all, but it's about knowing yourself and like, what do I genuinely desire to do? What works for me? What allows me to have that sense of momentum in the day? And again, it could be different for, for everybody. So I would say it's about a person finding out what is it that brings them into their center. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, um, a coach, asked me this uh, recently and you know it was kind of like well what could you do during the day that's you know just a short thing that really helps you uh, kind of feel energized get back on track and then you know you can do the rest of your day and you might even have to do that a couple of times you know work for a little bit do it again and and I said you know for me it's it's nature right I love to go walk out by trees or rivers or see wildlife and so, you know, sometimes I'll just walk down to the river and see if there's ducks down there or a beaver or <laughs> whatever, and then wander back. And that just kind of helps me feel centered. So is that those are the kind of things that you're, you're talking about, you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely stuff like that, right? It's, it's the, the little things in life that prime your day with experiences that inherently have gratitude woven in or inherently have a sense of empowerment woven in. So very similar to you, like the morning routine that I have as an example that helps, helps me to fill, fill myself up is I actually begin. The first thing that I do is I go and I start doing some kind of work and it's usually work on whatever it is that I want. I normally don't have like a set thing that I have to do every morning, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's creating or outlining a, a podcast or a training that I'm going to be doing, whatever is inspiring me upon waking up. Now, the reason why I do that, like first thing is because it just gives me a sense of momentum. But about an hour into that, uh, my girlfriend and I, we go and take the dogs out for a walk. So we get out in the sun and then we go for our own walk in the park. <laughs> now, <usually about laughs> you like take 30, yourself for a walk. <laughs> yeah, about like 30, 30, 40 minutes. And what, yeah. what I've noticed is like just walking outside together having a conversation in the sun, you know, having a little bit of a sweat, uh, hydrating, drinking water, just like these really like little things allow me to enter my day for like the rest of the day, feeling as though like I filled my cup. 
right? Mm-hmm. I've connected with the person that I love. I'm out in the sun. I'm getting, you know, exposure to nature. I've hydrated myself. Right. I, you know, I, I've, I've already got some momentum on something that I care about work-wise. So I, that is what gives me the momentum and what allows me to feel that sense of fullness going into the day, working with clients. Right. And I, as I'm thinking about it, it's really good for you epigenetically too. <laughs> 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 have that morning sunlight and it, and it really resets all of the uh the the hormones and you know all of that the inner workings of the body there so like what you're talking about you know, I'm, I'm like oh yeah there's a good connection here, right <laughs> oh, yeah um these are all great things for us physically and mentally mm-hmm. um so you mentioned just just now and i know this is something that you talk a lot about and, and that's gratitude mm-hmm. and um you know i i've vacillate in and out sometimes with gratitude list. I'm like really good about like, you know, saying how grateful I are, I am for five things a day or whatever it is. And then mm-hmm. sometimes I'm, 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 I don't, I'm not on that. So how do you, how do you put gratitude every day and how do you keep that and sustain that going? Because sometimes, you know, when life throws you curveballs, you're just like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think this is a great question because Gratitude is such a fundamental piece of our sense of well-being and a fundamental piece to serving from an overflowing cup, right? It's, we're not going to be able to have the sensation of the overflow, like the emotional overflow of being able to serve others because we are so full if we don't actually begin with gratitude. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I've, I've tried many different practices of gratitude, like journaling it down, visualizing and taking these things in. And now what I found is actually with just the way that I, carry out that morning where I'm spending the morning with the the person that I love most in this world and getting to actually be outside in nature and getting Mm -hmm. to my body. And there is an inherent gratitude that I get, that I experience in doing that. Like, just like the fact that I get to do that every morning and it, it charges that feeling up like very, very intensely within me. Mm -hmm. But the thing around gratitude that I think is so important is that The reason why I teach it to students and clients is not because I think it's the right thing to do or because like I feel obligated into my gratitude, right? (laughs) There's a lot of practices out there or maybe even influencers that perhaps might talk about it in a way that makes it feel like a chore. And then if you're not doing it, you're not doing the right things and you're not being responsible with your emotions and you're, you know, doing all, anyway, shaming ourselves into trying to be grateful. Right. (laughs) And the, the path to gratitude is not through shaming oneself and being like, I am not grateful enough. It's not another <laughs> reason to beat yourself up. The reason why I will share gratitude is because I like the result of what gratitude brings. Meaning the, when you're grateful for things in life, you end up creating more of what you are already grateful for. So you're basically telling the universe, telling the, the outside world, I'm grateful for this thing. I'm grateful for the, these experiences I'm having. And so you create more of what you emotionally engage in. Whereas the other side of the coin, I would say the opposite of gratitude would be complaining is when you complain, it's like the universe gives you more to complain about. It almost like responds with like, Oh, I see you like complaining. So here you go. Here's some more things. to (laughs) So I prefer the result that gratitude brings in the sense that it brings me more of what I'm actually grateful for. So by starting my day in that way, and just like these really simple things that I can be grateful for, you know, oftentimes some of the stuff that we'll talk about, we'll talk about memories and we'll talk about things that we're grateful Mm -hmm. for that are in the conversation. So I, I found that doing it like this is a Mm -hmm. much more natural path for me to experience gratitude rather than, you know, sitting and writing yeah. something down or having this like step-by-step step, got to be grateful for three things today. <laughs> I just let it be part of my morning and, and my conversations with my girlfriend. Right. Yeah, no, I, I love that actually, because I think you're right. Part of, you know, when you get coaching or, you know, you read a book or something like that, a lot of it is, you know, like write five things that, you know, so it's like, a, it becomes like a checklist, right? Rather, it's like another thing to do rather than to really feel it and feel into it and, you know, and actually being present in that moment, right? And, and saying like, wow, this is great. I get to go for this walk. I get to be out in the sun. I get to, I, and it is, I get to, I get to do all of these things, which mm-hmm. is really um, what you're talking about there. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, 
one of the things that you talk about, and it kind of goes along a little bit, I think, with with gratitude, because if we don't, if we're not doing gratitude and we're doing the complaining thing, a lot of that comes from the desire of having, and this is something that you talk about. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's something that you know fits in here, but it seemed like it would fit in here because a lot of times we're we're looking at, well, I don't have this, right? We're coming from that place of lack, and I really want that, and it's that desire of having. And then you talk about this this conceptual life. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is fascinating. <laughs> I've got to ask about this. Tell, tell uh, me and, and the listeners more about this idea of the desire of having, and this idea of this conceptual life. Mm-hmm. And, and I really feel like it kind of fits in with the gratitude and not being in that, that present moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the desire from having is a really important concept in terms of creating the things that we seek to experience. So oftentimes when we want things in our lives, when we want to manifest something or we want to achieve something and we're focused on the not having of it, sometimes the pain or the negative emotion generated from the not having can be a motivator in somebody like going out and having ambition to get something. But the problem with that way of doing things is, is that the moment that you have what you want or you have Again, your motivation falls off until you perceive that you don't have again, and then it'll start back up. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of living life that creates some inconsistency in one's external results and even in their level of fulfillment and enjoyment of those things. So to desire from having is to actually begin with gratitude. So I like to, whenever I'm setting goals, like I have a whole framework that I use and whenever I'm doing goal setting, the first thing that I'll ask is like, what's the context that I want to achieve this goal in, right? Is it career? Is it relationship? Is it uh, spirituality? Is it my health? Is it my lifestyle or my growth? And I'll pick a category and then I'll ask myself first and foremost, okay, what do I already have here that I'm grateful for that I can appreciate? Because the whole idea is that we can build on progress and we can build on appreciation and gratitude for what we have. We can't build on failure and lack and Mm -hmm. It, a feeling of emptiness, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Instead, we can build on what we already have. And the, the sensations that we are experiencing for what we already have now, the only reason we even want the thing that we perceive to lack is because we think that that thing is going to give us the sensations that mm. we could just experience right now with what we have. And interestingly enough, if we start from that place, we start from the gratitude of what we already do have and we build upon that, then it makes it easier for us to create that which we want rather than coming from this place of lack and needing to not have in order to be motivated to action. If we desire from having, then we're motivated when we have. So the compounded results of that actually end up being a lot more fruitful for us because we're coming from this place that is this overflowing cup of gratitude. Great. That's awesome. So I want to continue this this conversation because I, I want to talk about this idea of the conceptual life. And then I want to talk a little bit about goal setting too, because so many of us set goals and and you know, sometimes we look back and we don't achieve them. And so I want the listeners to stay tuned because we're gonna really get into the meat of these things when we get back. And um, you know, continue listening. We'll be right back on the Best Living Show. And I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Best Living Show. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet, and today I have Victor joining me. He is a master coach in many different ways, including uh, neuro-linguistic programming. We've been talking about uh, how to serve from an overflowing cup, how to uh, live with gratitude, and then we started to get into a little bit of uh, goals and uh, desired outcome. So that's what we, we're going to get into now. But before we do that, Victor, you know, for those of the people, those of the viewers and, and people listening, where can they find out more about you? Um, so the best place to find out more about me is going to my Instagram, victor.zenstoic. Um, my Instagram has daily content in the form of like short clips and videos, and usually around things that help you solve specific problems in life. 
the other way, if you want to dive deeper, it would be my podcast, which is the Zen Stoic Path, where I go into all kinds of these topics, including, you know, the goal setting stuff. I just recently re- released an episode on that. So um, that's that's essentially where you can find me. Yep. I I can attest that his Instagram is, is great with all the little clips. I've been watching lots of them and <laughs> learning a ton, you know, just picking up, oh, let me write that down. That's a, that's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just, just so, little nuggets, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, so sometimes those little bite-sized nuggets is just, if you just one of those a day and, and really it can transform your whole life if you mm-hmm. just follow those each each nugget right you absolutely go the whole journey so yeah. I, I i've totally enjoyed them so uh hopefully listeners of the show will go visit victor on instagram and see some of his nug- nuggets of wisdom <laughs> all right so i want to get back to uh goal setting we kind of started to talk about that uh coming out of that idea of the con- you know the conceptual life or the the perfect life and you talk about sincere goals and listening to your intuition. So what, what is, what is a sincere goal? So I would say, so I'll start by describing what is not an, a sincere goal or what is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that the, the goals that are not sincere or not, not coming from a place of intuition are typically the things that we feel like we're supposed to want. And it's really important for us to check in every now and again and ask ourselves like is this something that I actually want Mm. or that I feel like I'm supposed to want Mm. and oftentimes when you ask yourself that question you'll get some kind of a sensation or feeling in your body you may have thoughts go through your head you may have like words come up or pictures come up whatever it is but if you notice that the feeling isn't so good or if it doesn't feel stable or strong then there's a possibility that maybe it's not something that you genuinely desire. Mm. And this is really important for us to be able to understand. And one of the things that keeps us from having the sense of clarity on what we truly want is a concept of something called emotional debt. Mm. Now, emotional debt you could look at as it's the accumulation of all the unprocessed negative emotions, significant emotional events, traumas, Um, limiting narratives that you may have about yourself, incongruent values, inner conflicts that you may have, and all the accumulation of all those things that we haven't yet processed or dealt with. Typically, all of that in the system acts as a filter for the world that we live in, right? So we start looking at current situations through our past situations. Like, sure, some of the listeners here have had the experience where they entered into a relationship and either themselves or the other person or both brought baggage from previous relationships. That's yeah. the Louis happen. Vuitton. <laughs> right. It's like, hold on, let me move my stuff in. I just have to move <laughs> all the emotional baggage. Yeah. So all of that filters our world. Like we, we hold right. all of that emotional charge in our nervous system. So the way that we experience the world through our five senses and what act, what we actually notice in the world is mm-hmm. filtered through all of that. Because and some of that actually is, I mean, I, as you talk about this, I'm thinking about it's the default mode network, right? It's that part of the brain that kind of puts all of this stuff up and to, for us to think about. Um, and then also um, it, it kind of is a, a schema that the brain runs to. It's because it's saying like, well, this happened to you in the past and we need to keep you safe. And so don't go do that again. And it kind of brings things up. I mean, it's, it's a kind of all on that same line, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes the goals that we have are influenced by past memories of things that have happened to Mm -hmm. us in our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is that oftentimes we might have a goal that is attempting to solve a non-problem in our lives, which (laughs) that's when you, I'm sure other people have also had this experience. I know I have where you work really hard at something and then you achieve the thing. And then you're like, is this all there is? Like, I thought it was going to be more festive or more, more fulfilling. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I totally get where you're coming from. There's what we call anticlimactic, right? It's kind of like you thought it was going to be something okay to fill your cup overflowing, right? Mm -hmm. Fireworks. And then you kind of get there and you're like, okay, that was underwhelming. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a great example of it because like, I'll give you an example of goals are set because a person perhaps wants to prove themselves to one of their parents or they want to prove someone wrong. It's like, 
the those <laughs> those goals are not sincere. They're actually respond or reacting mm. to a problem that mm. hasn't been addressed that's in the nervous system and the unconscious mind. Right. Right. And so when you ask yourself, like, do I really want this? Or am I just trying to resolve something within myself? Or am, am I just trying to uh supposed to want this thing? Yeah. Whatever, however you might might ask it of yourself and just notice how you feel right because your body will respond somatically to the words and the questions that you ask so mm. i think one of the things that i like to ask is like okay do i really want this thing mm. and i want to come from that place of sincerity so usually you can check in with your body and ask yourself like what does it feel like to gen to feel genuine and sincere in wanting something and what does it feel like to supposed to want something <laughs> And there'll be a difference in feeling. Mm -hmm. So with that, with that being said, the emotional debt that we have upon clearing it, we're able to see, see more clearly or filter the world more clearly through what we genuinely feel. And that's the whole purpose of doing things like inner work, right? Doing things like therapy and really just doing our best to update our system, our internal system to what is most effective to create the desired results that we want today. Mm -hmm. So as you talked about, I was like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I had this um, revelation many years ago, but I was sitting and actually listening to Robert Kiyosaki, mm -hmm. uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? When he, I had one of his tapes at, and it just came across like a ton of bricks, like, oh, the whole reason I went to, to grad school and got a master's degree and PhD and all of that was to prove a point mm -hmm. to some teacher or headmaster that you know i don't i don't even remember anymore right <laughs> but i could do it because he told me i could never go to college mm -hmm. and i was like i'm gonna prove a point but then you know once i got doing the work that i had kind of trained for it was kind of like oh, is this all there is for it like it doesn't feel like it, it it's the right path for me right mm -hmm. and so i think it you know that, that was it took a long time for me to even come to that point because i think i was so driven by that i'm going to prove this point um that i didn't even stop to think about it and, mm. and check in with that yeah yeah it's proving a point is not a fulfilling reason <laughs> to do anything <laughs> right right well i'm glad i actually did it and accomplished yeah. it i'm grateful for that um, yeah, was, it's brought a lot of good into your life, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. But at, at the same time, it was like, it took a lot to kind of, you know, two by four over the head to say, oh, okay, that goal and that I worked on for all those years wasn't so much a, about me, but about proving a point of someone else. And, and you know, as, as you were talking, I was also thinking about, you know, I, I Yes, clients sometimes say that they're kind of, they feel like they're on this kind of hamster wheel, right? Running like, and they don't feel fulfilled and, but they don't, they don't know how to get off that cycle. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do they tune into to this? How, is there some tools or tips that you can give people to, they don't have to have a two by four, like <laughs> over the head, they can start to really feel into that, that perhaps you know, whatever they're doing that they feel is unfulfilled and they, you know, on this hamster wheel that they can tune into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so there's a, there's a few things that come to mind. One of the first things that come to mind is um, the, the meditation that you got to experience when you saw me speak for the first time, it's called mm -hmm. the sovereign dream. Right. And that meditation essentially will show you via your unconscious mind what is it that you truly desire to be doing, experiencing, feeling, and thinking? And it gives a very, very clear roadmap of exactly what that would look like in your life. And so anybody who's listening to this, if you'd like access to that, feel free to send me a DM on Instagram, just with the word dream, and I will happily send it to you because that'd be a good start to be able to essentially get a not a fabricated vision, but one that you, that's already within you. Right. And it'll, it'll just help reveal that to you. So that's, that's my gift to the world. And to anybody listening to this is like, let, just send me a message and I'm happy to send it over to you. So that's one thing. The other thing that somebody can do is if they feel like they're in that hamster wheel, the idea is to find what, what can they control right now in their environment to begin moving in the direction of what they want. So 
first and foremost, we got to know what is it that we want and in what context do we feel like we're on that hamster wheel? So let's say somebody feels like they're on the hamster wheel in their work life, right? So in the context of career, what are they already grateful for in that? Even though they feel like they're on the hamster wheel, what can they build off of that they have? It's like maybe they're grateful for the experience that they have, the credentials that they've built up, the credibility that they've built up. Maybe they don't like what they're doing, but what about their career can they find, even if it's very little, that they're already grateful for? Then it's important to recognize the current reality. Most of the time, we don't make decisions to actually change or create changes in our lives because the important changes that are truly worthwhile are never easy and they're never convenient to make. Right? There's always something that can get in the way. But the thing is, most of the reason why we don't change or we don't make the decision to make the changes is because either the problem that is in our way is unconscious to us, like we don't know it's even there, we don't know that we're doing something that's actually self sabotaging, or we've normalized it. Like we do know where that we're doing it, but we've normalized it so much that we just think like, oh, this is just how life is, right? And you can think of when you've normalized something, it's usually when you're tolerating things that you just don't like. You're tolerating the unfulfilling job. You're tolerating the messy kitchen or the messy living room or the, the beat up car. The mm -hmm. tolerance for those things is us normalizing what is just absolutely not okay relative to the values that we want to express and live in this life. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that current reality and being like, oh, this really is a problem. <laughs> like, like being real with yourself and being like this, you know, if I kept doing this for six months, a year, two years, three years, like what impact does that have on my health, my relationships, my wealth? Like just getting very real with oneself, I think mm -hmm. is a really important step because that also gives us the leverage to be like this problem and what I want to experience can't exist simultaneously. And I need to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And it is in decisions that we are able to shape our lives into how we want them to be. Most of the time when people don't experience what they want is because they're not making decisions. They're sitting on the fence or they're afraid of who they are without this problem. And so getting real with oneself and again, starting from that place of gratitude and then pairing that with, you know, getting real with yourself and being objective and being like, okay, here's what's going on. And this is what I need to change. And then allowing yourself to ask the question, okay, what would I rather have instead? Like, what is my ideal life? Like, what is my ideal situation in this context? How would I like my work to be? Or how would I like my relationship to be? Or what kind of a body do I want to have? How do I want to feel like all of these questions can come to mind when somebody's envisioning the ideal they want to be able to experience. And in doing so, once we know what it is that we want, then getting really clear on why we want it. Like, why is this important? Why now? You know, who, who does this affect by me getting the result that I want? Like, who benefits from this? Who else gets, gets benefit? What's the ripple effect? Who do I become in the process as a person? And then from that point, that's when we can start to okay, be like, okay, here are the milestones. Here are like the key results that I need to, need to, need to get. So we start to allow ourselves to become more clear about, about what we're actually going to use as metrics towards our success and towards our progress. So that is essentially the first half of the goal setting framework that I, that I use for people. Um, it's like, I'll, I'll summarize it. It's actually, the acronym is actually dream. D is to desire from having, right? Having that that sense of gratitude where you're at. R is to recognize your current reality. E is to envision the ideal. A is to align your intentions, discover your why. M is your meaningful milestones. What is going to be meaningful for you to achieve? Like how will you know that you're getting closer? Like mm -hmm. if it's a weight loss goal, it's like, okay, well, 10 pounds, losing 10 pounds is my first meaningful milestone, then 20, then 30. Or if it's business, it's like my first sale is my first meaningful, meaningful milestone on this new project, then, you know, 10 and then so on and so forth. So we give ourselves, if we give ourselves a framework like this, we get very clear on exactly what it is. And we bring a lot of focus into that. This, what this allows us to do by recognizing the importance and the why and everything behind it is it allows us to make the decision to actually make our lives about this thing that is truly and genuinely important to us rather than try to conveniently squeeze it into our busy schedule. <laughs>
Right. And how much does fear play a role in this? Because as you're talking, I, I think, you know, uh, perhaps putting myself in, in, you know, people's listening shoes, you know, like, well, you know, I desire this, you know, I can think about like wanting that change, but then, you know, there's that fear of, well, do I, maybe do I deserve this or, um, you know, whatever, whatever that might come up for them, some, some anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So fear, fear is a really interesting thing. And I would say it's, if you have fear, that doesn't mean not to do something. Right. Because what we can do is we can embody a sense of courage, which courage only exists by first having fear. It's having fear and acting in spite of the fear. It's not the absence of fear. So a lot of the time, like these changes will feel scary mm. and moving away from what is familiar, even if it's a problem still will feel scary and that's okay. It's part of the process. And the idea and the key is to embrace that feeling, allow yourself to feel the fear. Don't try to avoid it necessarily. Don't try to bypass it or, you know, pretend it's not there, but really allow yourself the opportunity to embrace that sensation and then alchemize that into action. Like use that emotion as fuel so that you don't have to have the problem of being afraid of a change like this in the future. So that you can have a sense of sovereignty over your everyday life and over the things that you want to express and live and you know, enjoy in your life. Yeah. And I think part of that, as, as you said, is who else does this affect, right? That brings it out to a, a bigger, a bigger reason why to, to do it, right? If you feel like you can bring other people in and say, okay, I'm doing this because of much bigger reason. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's a great way to look at it. Well, we come to a second break. So uh, really enjoying this conversation. And when we come back, uh, we're going to continue to talk a little bit about goals and, and obstacles. You have a, an interesting way of looking at obstacles. And then we'll, we'll get into a little bit of, of kind of your philosophy and how you approach things. So listeners, stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss any of this. And uh, don't and forget that you uh, remember, I should say, that mm -hmm. you can uh, DM Victor with Dream and he will send you that great uh visualization to uh, really hone in on what it is that you want to achieve. So thank you for listening. We'll be right back on The Best Living Show. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet. Hello and welcome back to The Best Living Show. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet, and we have been having a fascinating conversation with Coach Victor. Uh, we've been talking about emotional debt and uh, how to release that, how to set goals, how to really uh, start to think about things differently and to fill your cup um, so that you can serve from a place of uh, fulfillment and, you know, to get things out of life that you want to achieve. Right. <laughs> right. So on that, um, you know, we had started talking about, uh, your framework for goal setting. Mm. And, um, I wanted to go back to that because a lot of coaches talk about the why, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people get stuck. Well, I have no idea why. And I hear that so many times. I don't know what my why is. I don't know what my passion is. Mm -hmm. What do you say to, to people who are listening right now? Who, I know exactly what she's saying. Like I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. So I think this whole idea of coaches and influencers telling you like, oh, you got to find your why or you got to find your uh -huh. purpose and like <laughs> all of that. To they're making something that is actually very simple, very complex, so that you buy whatever their program is <laughs> to find that <laughs> why or whatever it is that they, they're telling you they're going to help you find. Right. So our purpose, like I, I did a podcast recently, not too long ago, about like finding one's purpose in life. And this has been glorified by the whole personal development world of like, you got to find your purpose and live your purpose. And they make it like this Hollywood movie fairy tale kind of thing. where like, you have to have this one purpose and this is what your life is about. And it's all dramatic. And it's like, that's not how it works. And that's not the most practical or enjoyable way to experience it. 
the idea is that like we have a different life purpose at all different stages of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that includes like our why, right? Our why is different at different times in our life. And our why is different in different contexts of our life. The strongest why that you have affects all areas of life, right? So you may have a why that is more core to you. Like, well, I do this because I want, I, I want to be the best person I can be for my kids. Or I do this because um, I want to honor uh, this person that I love who passed away. I do this because I want to be able to give people this gift that I've been so fortunate to receive in terms of these changes and transformations that I've made. So it can be different for everybody. And really and truly, like if we go back to that dream framework for the goals, when you align your intentions, like if you want to find your why, you can just ask yourself like, when this result is actualized, when I get this result or I achieve this goal, like who does it affect positively? Like, how does it make their lives better? How does it make my life better? Like what's meaningful about it? And because our why doesn't have to be complicated. It's literally like, how does this improve the quality of life? How does this remove some of the stresses of life that I've I've been dealing with or tolerating in my life? So I think simplifying the why and just asking yourself like, well, what does this do for you? What does this do for others? Rather than getting to a place where you're like, oh, I got it. I just got to find my why. And like, now you've given yourself this other like rabbit chase. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense because it's just, a, it's as simple as like asking yourself, who does this affect positively? How does this affect me positively? Who do I become in the process? And like, as you start asking yourself these questions, that's when the answers start coming up. A lot of the time, one of the reasons why we have trouble with this sense of clarity on like what we want or why we want it is because we're trying to, we, we're actually talking in statements by saying things like, I don't know what my why is, or I got to find my why. Those are statements. And saying those doesn't actually help you find anything. Saying them actually- Coming from that place of lack again, right? right. Like, I don't that. have it. It's coming from that place of lack and it presupposes that you don't have it or that you don't know what it is. And the reality is like everybody knows what it is unless they pretend to forget what it is, which is what we do when we start saying stuff like that. (laughs) So instead, what we can do is ask ourselves those questions, right? Like questions are the answers. You can think of it like that, like ask yourself good, high quality questions, open-ended questions that lead you to your desired outcome and questions they open up the loop um, of, of seeking, you can look at it like that. Like when we ask a question, I'll give you an example. I ask this one question on a regular basis because it leads to what I want to be able to see in everything and everyone. So I'll ask myself, how did life come to be so perfect? Why is life so perfect? And what this does is this gets my reticular activating system, my RAS to start seeking to find the answer to that question seeking the evidence of perfection that already exists in my life each and every day. And that again has inherent gratitude to it. So when we're like finding our why through questions is how we're going to get there. Not by demanding of ourselves that we come up with a good poetic sounding why. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So, so really tuning in to ourselves and Mm -hmm kind of feeling into that and then asking those questions of, you know, going back again to what is it that, that really fills me up, right? What, what is it that I feel good doing? I mean, you talked a a little bit uh, when we were kind of beginning the show, like, well, I do the things that really fire me up and then someone else can do things that really fire them up that don't, don't fire me up. I mean, it's kind of feeds into that too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's unique to everybody, right? So it's about asking ourselves the, the questions that actually pertain to what, what our reasons are for doing things and what benefits they're going to bring to ourselves and the people that we care about. Right. That, that bigger reason why we would want to engage in whatever it is that we we're choosing mm-hmm. to do. That's right. And then, you know, before we took our break, we, we started to talk about a little bit about fear. So someone says, okay, I've, I've asked all these questions of myself, you know, um, I've kind of got an idea now of what it is, uh, the direction I want to go in, but, um, you know, so there's kind of that fear, uh, 
there's the what ifs and then there's these these obstacles like you talk about kind of obstacles that get mm -hmm. thrown up in your path and and i thought it was a very interesting take on these these idea of obstacles mm -hmm. so how do you view obstacles that come up because a lot of times people get defeated or they try and find a way around it but you're kind of saying like nope that the obstacle is what we what we got to do we've mm -hmm. got to solve that obstacle yes so um marcus aurelius would say in his meditations um for those who are unfamiliar with that marcus aurelius was a roman emperor who who basically had a journal and that journal got turned into a book called marcus aurelius meditations that has been around for centuries and like all different kinds of world leaders business leaders athletes have used this book as like a guide for themselves and one of the things that he wrote in there is this idea that the impediment to action it, the, the impediment to action of what stands in the way becomes the way. So this whole idea is that the obstacle, Ryan Holiday, um, a local author, you know, here in Austin, wrote a book called The Obstacles the Way. So the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And that's the Marcus Aurelius quote. And the whole idea of this is, is that when you decide that you want something, right? When you decide that something is important to you, your mind refilters the entire external reality that you have to notice things that are relevant to what you've said was important. So if you come up with a goal, you're saying that this is important to you. When you have these strong reasons and these benefits and these things that you have emotional charge with, right, that you feel really emotionally connected to, things you start to notice different things in the environment. And so with that being said, one thing that happens is that we will start to notice not just we'll notice a few different things we'll either notice things that are resources that can help us to get our goals so we'll like stepping stones or like little little things in in the form of like help that guide us right. towards the goal or like things that can assist us with the goal we'll notice neutral things like things that don't matter or anything mm -hmm. or we'll notice obstacles and when we notice obstacles, this is really, really important because many times people will look at an obstacle and look at the obstacle as a deterrent, mm -hmm. as like this, this means I can't have my goal. This is in the way. So now I can't. And so we give our power to the obstacle. And when we give our power to the obstacle by saying I can't because of X, then what happens is the obstacle helps us to con confirm the, the very identity that we are trying to escape with this new goal. Mm -hmm. And so when we experience an obstacle, we have a choice to either overcome the obstacle or allow the obstacle to define us. And so every time we experience obstacles, you can think of it like this. It's like when you set a goal, your unconscious mind will project obstacles into your reality. And the projection of obstacles into your reality is not to say that they magically appeared. It means that now that you've decided that this thing is important, you're operating away in a way that has you running into obstacles, things that will help to build your character and help you develop mm -hmm. as a person. So every time you experience an obstacle, you can experience an obstacle in the form of a situation or an actual person. And there could be like some conflict there. So every time you experience an obstacle, there's this great quote by uh, Peter Crone where he says, life will present you with people and situations to show you where you're not yet free. So you can think of obstacles as the same thing. Obstacles will present themselves to you in between you and the attainment of the goal to show you where you are not yet free within yourself. So mm -hmm. when the obstacles come up and you feel the fear, the idea is feel the fear, feel the emotions, whatever it is that comes up for you, and still do the thing anyway. You can feel your feelings and you can still act on what's important to you. Because not doing that and allowing yourself to stay in the old reality of the thing that you were tolerating and the problem you were normalizing is a lot scarier <laughs> than pursuing forward into this new life. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Uh, very powerful. So, you know, the idea of, of really coming back now to looking at that emotional debt that we have, sorting that out, looking at what's in front of us, right? And then just going through it and, and having the courage to do that because it builds 
us up, it builds character, and it really puts us on the path to to where we want to go. And mm -hmm. and that's you know this life that is filled with gratitude and the things that we want to do in life. So that's right. A, that was a very powerful uh, Victor. Thank you so much for that. So we have a couple of minutes left, and you know. I want to let listeners know again, like if they're interested, you talked about your podcast, Instagram, um, you do some coaching and things like that. How can they find out about like coaching if they want to dig deeper into this? Yeah. So um, again, you can always DM me on Instagram. That's the most direct path to, <laughs> to connecting with me and finding out more. Um, you can also visit my website that talks about the types of coaching and training that I do. It's called it. The website is training.zenstoic.com. And there you can see information about the previous trainings, other people's experiences. Um, of course, I always say the best way is to just reach out to me directly. I do answer all my DMs. So I, I look forward to hearing from you. And if this any of this has resonated with you, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to connect. That, that's great. Um, so one of the questions I always ask my guests at the end of the show is, what do you do to intentionally thrive? Mm. <laughs> What do I do to intentionally thrive? I would, the first thing that comes to mind is I have a good sense of humor and I know how to laugh at myself and laugh at the silliness of the world and make sure I don't take myself too seriously. And, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and so in doing that, I find a lot of value and benefit in being able to laugh at situations because he, I heard this quote the other day, which I thought was, was brilliant, which is humor is common sense moving at a different speed. It's like humor is common sense dancing. And so it helps us like realize the truth and loosen ourselves, loosen the model of the world that we have so that we might have more pliability and flexibility in how we can live our lives. Right. Right. Yeah. I love that sense of humor uh, and just feeling lighter when you, when you talked about that, it just felt lighter, right? That you, life feels lighter if you can not feel so serious about everything all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Well, as always, the show has gone by so fast and I always mm -hmm. feel like I didn't get to ask all the questions I wanted to ask. Um, and I'm sure that the listeners are, you know, wanting to know more. And so feel free to find Victor on Instagram, uh, his website, listen to his podcast, find out more because there's a wealth of information there. Uh, and those daily little nuggets that you can pick up and really start to dig into what we talked about today um, and really creating the life that you really want to live and not being on that hamster wheel. Um, and so I'm, I'm so happy that you agreed to come on the show and talk with us, Victor. And uh, I, I really appreciate you being here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for having okay. me. And to everybody out there, thank you so much for listening. And we will be back with more podcasts in a couple of weeks. And thank you for listening to The Best Living Show. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet. Thanks for listening to The Best Living Show. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Sweet. Breathe, eat, sleep, thrive in every aspect of your life on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in Thursdays at 6 p.m. to continue your new narrative and step into a new way of being. We are not what people have told us we are. We are so much more than that. I am going to help you thrive and get the answers you desire, not only in the external world, but on the inside. For more information, go to DrRachelSweet.com. That's DrRachelSweet.com. 